Hello and welcome to the arbitration conversation. So in this conversation, we're gonna talk about a really hot issue, a really hot case. It's the Henry Schein case that has gone to the US Supreme Court. Recently, they had oral arguments. It's been a very important case. A lot of people are watching it. And people watching it include a scholar in the area of arbitration, Imre Salai, he's been, he's been studying and writing about and teaching arbitration for many years. I've been following his work. He's very, very smart. He, of course, um, graduated from Yale University where he double majored in economics and classical civilization. Um, he was also a member of the Yale fencing team, which I think would be really interesting. Um, he received his law degree from Columbia University. He practiced law in New York and Miami in complex civil litigation. And now he is, of course, teaching arbitration and is an expert in the field. Um, Emory, first of all, thank you so much for taking time. Oh, thank you, Amy. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate this opportunity. Thanks. Well, part of what sparked my, well, of course, I wanted to interview you from the very beginning of this whole kind of arbitration conversation, but I saw that you worked on an amicus brief in the Henry Schein case and have been heavily involved and in following that case. So I'm wondering if, first of all, you could just kind of tell us what kind of get us up to speed on what happened to that in that case and where we are procedurally. Sure. This is the second time the case has gone up to the U.S. Supreme Court. And in this go round, the Supreme Court in a one sentence order dismisses cert, issues an order dismissing cert as improvidently granted. And uh, the first time this went up to the court, um, there was an issue regarding delegation. And this is the topic of, can we delegate arbitra arbitrability matters to an arbitrator? Like, is there a binding agreement? And does the dispute fall within the scope of that clause? And um, the first time this went up to the Supreme Court, there was an issue whether baseless arguments, did baseless arguments still have to be sent to the arbitrator? And the Supreme Court in the first shot opinion said yes. And it was, uh, I think, the first opinion ever written by Justice Kavanaugh. It was a unanimous decision. And so uh, even a baseless argument would still have to be sent to arbitration. And this time around, um, the arbitration, this second time before the Supreme Court, uh, there was an issue regarding a carve out. In other words, the scope of the arbitration clause exempted uh, claims for injunctive relief. And the question upon which cert was granted is whether that carve out, does that negate a clear and unmistakable delegation? And um, that's the, that was the question upon which cert was granted. And there was a, a cross petition also filed the second time up, whether there was a clear and unmistakable delegation to begin with. And I, I think the key to understanding the most recent uh, decision, which is a one sentence order from the court uh, that cert was improvidently granted is if you look at oral argument from this past December, 2020, uh, there's an exchange between Justice Alito and counsel for the respondent. And Justice Alito says, it's the court's fault. And then he backpedals a little bit and says, no, it's the court's responsibility to have really uh, granted the cross petition that there was a, a, um, a threshold issue raised in the cross petition that we can't really avoid in deciding the issue upon which cert was granted. It's almost like uh, the issue upon which cert was granted involves a threshold question. It assumes something very big that a clear and unmistakable delegation exists here. And that topic, what counts as a clear and unmistakable delegation, it's splitting courts. And so uh, um, I think Justice Alito, he admits that there's a threshold issue here and the cross petition should have been granted, but it wasn't. And that was a mistake by the court. The court really couldn't, con the court couldn't consider fully the question presented in the current case without examining really, was there a proper, clear, unmistakable delegation to begin with? And if you take a simple example, like um, imagine, and so what happened is the uh, cert was dismissed. And so now the standing order is that there is no binding obligation to arbitrate. This case should proceed to court now. And this has been years of fighting where they're going to fight. It's this, uh, this kills me every time that there's years of fighting over arbitration. It undermines the whole value of arbitration. It's, yeah, I talk about this all the time with my all this litigation about arbitration. This is such a great example. So one thing I want to sort of backing up a little bit, when you talk about whether there was a clear and unmistakable agreement to arbitrate arbitrability, which of course is the central question, as you said, that Justice Alito was pointing out. Now, and this was because it was by virtue of simply incorporating the AAA rules, that's correct. So imagine a simple agreement, like, like you and I promise to arbitrate. Like if we have a one sentence agreement 
there's no delegation of arbitrability matters to an arbitrator. There's a simple promise that you and I agree to arbitrate. And then the question becomes, if you and I agree to arbitrate and the very next sentence says, we will adopt the AAA rules and the AAA rules will have a promise or they'll have a clause recognizing that arbitrators can rule on their own jurisdiction. Does that count as a clear and unmistakable delegation? And federal appellate courts have said yes, but there are state appellate courts that have held no. Uh, that the incorporation by reference of outside rules don't, doesn't count as a clear and unmistakable delegation. And I think this is an important issue to be decided one day by the court, but this case was not the proper vehicle. Um, the, this case, I think, involved a poorly drafted clause. Um, there was a, if you look at the clause in Henry Schein, it said that they agreed to arbitrate pursuant to the AAA rules. And there are more than 200 sets of AAA rules, and not all of them contain a jurisdictional provision allowing arbitrators to resolve their own arbitrability issues. And so there's just, uh, I think, uncertainty which AAA rules were adopted. And to make matters worse, um, and actually, as an aside, I was surprised to see 200 sets of rules, but that reminds me of one of the positive aspects of arbitration, the creativity and innovation that can occur with arbitration. Right. Um, but just they didn't, the clause was poorly drafted. And I think in another case, if there's a clear incorporation of say the AAA's consumer rules, which does recognize the ability of arbitrators to recognize their own jurisdiction in a clear case with a better fact pattern, um, I think this issue would be presented more concretely for the court to decide in the future. And so but just- really, like, And on a practical matter, you know, I'm just thinking if I don't really understand this whole idea and they say, okay, the Supreme Court has said, go home, this is improvidently granted. But as you said, I mean, now it goes back, what exactly is gonna happen next? I mean, do we think this really will then go back and have they already made a determination in the lower courts? I think that um, there's a declaration. I thought there was a declaration that there's no obligation to arbitrate, that because of the exception, the carve out, this lawsuit sinks in, seeks injunctive relief. And I think the fifth circuit has held that that means they're exempt from arbitration. Uh, because of that carve out. And so now the case will proceed, uh, I guess, to the next stage discovery. Uh, it's a complex, the underlying claims involve an antitrust conspiracy. I imagine um, because of the sensitivity, uh, mm -hmm. there's gonna be tremendous pressure to settle with those types of substantive claims. Um, but there's another reason I think why this case was not an appropriate beat. There's a clear circuit split between the federal, not circuit split, but a split between the federal courts and state courts regarding incorporation of outside rules by reference. But this case involves a non-signatory where the defendant uh, was a non-signatory to the contract. And so I think it's awkward, like they have no existing relationship between the plaintiff and the defendant at all. So how can they even argue that they clearly and unmistakably agreed to arbitrate, whether they agreed to arbitrate if there's actually no relationship between the parties at all? And so this was just, with you have, when you add to the mix a non-signatory, uh, this is just not the appropriate case to say there was a clear and unmistakable delegation. So I think yeah. that with the two signatories, uh, with a clearly written contract incorporating a specific AAA set of rules, you may have a better vehicle for cert to be granted on in the future. So right. I think that's why cert just wasn't granted in this case. But I think it raises a really important issue. I do think it's, I know I'm just kind of thinking back to, and we all, you know, going back, any of us who followed the rules and followed the Federal Arbitration Act and kind of how it's developed in terms of jurisprudence around the Federal Arbitration Act, you can go back to a case like Prima Paint required a clear and unmistakable agreement to arbitrate, right? Otherwise it goes to the court as the gatekeeper. Then we sort of see this inclusion of delegation clauses, giving the arbitrator the power to arbitrate arbitrability. In other words, the arbitrator then has power to arbitrate his or her, to decide his or her own jurisdiction, right? And arguably that can promote efficiency, but now we fast forward and we see how it just continues to grow. And now we're talking about non-signatories. Now we're talking about incorporation of rules by reference being sufficient. Brings us back to kind of the history of the Federal Arbitration Act and an area that you've written a book about. So I know you've done the research on this. Where do you see this falling in terms of the history of the Federal Arbitration Act. Do you think the drafters of the Federal Arbitration Act would say, oh, sure, this is a good way to proceed and that we should allow for these delegation clauses to be incorporated by reference in ambiguous rules? Oh, I think the drafters would be rolling over in their graves. It's a, 
it's almost like so many fictions have developed where I don't even recognize the holdings or the principles or the governing standards. It just doesn't match up with the text of the statute. Um, actually, in the first Henry Schein decision, um, Justice Kavanaugh acknowledges that the text of the FAA says a court makes these determinations. Like there's no room in the text to allow for an arbitrator to do this. And he said very shortly, like one, three, uh, three words, like this ship has sailed. Like, you know, and, and it, I think if you look at the new justices, Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, Barrett, uh, they're very textualist or more textualist than their predecessors, I think, originalist. And um, I think that if they looked at a clean slate, they would probably allow no delegation at all because the statute provides for the court to make this core determination. And I, I like that idea of having a court supervise this private system. Um, we used to have wonderful decisions where courts would review the fairness of an arbitration clause. I, I've collected many cases where, uh, you know, maybe there's a 30 day statute of limitations. It's unfair. It's harsh for a consumer and employee, or um, there may be very limited discovery in a case. And you used to have older decisions before the Renda Center decision uh, where courts will review a clause and say, this is unfair, procedurally unfair. And now I almost see every week just courts rubber stamp arbitration clause. This is all for the arbitrator to decide without even ruling on the fairness of an arbitration clause. And so I, I like the idea of courts monitoring, supervising at a very minimal level, sort of as a gatekeeper to make sure that there's procedural fairness. And I think that was the intent behind the FAA. And unfortunately, as this was uh, in a very um, biting, this sentence really meant a lot for me when uh, Justice Kavanaugh said that ship has sailed. I think like an entire fleet has sailed for the whole FAA. Yeah. Uh, but, like if you look at just the, uh, if you look at the claims in this case, they're antitrust claims. There are claims that um, there's been a group boycott of the plaintiff. It's putting the plaintiff out of business. And these are claims that I think the public has a strong interest in hearing. There's a strong interest in promoting competition and regulating competition and having a uh, robust competition and lower prices for consumers. And these types of claims, I am confident, were never intended to be covered by the FAA. Uh, there's some wonderful language um, in the statute in section two, recognizing that only disputes that arise out of a contract, only disputes that arise out of, out of an agreement can be subject to arbitration. And if you go back to the 1980s, this is the Mitsubishi case. Mm -hmm. When they quote section two, this bothers me every time I think about it. When they get to that language, they actually, they put three little dots there as an ellipsis, they overlook that language that limits the FAA to contractual disputes. And then they start focusing on the antitrust laws, saying that there's nothing in the antitrust laws that are you know, uh, contrary to arbitration. And so it's almost like they've ignored the text of the FAA, deliberately ignored it to allow for its expansion. Yeah. And um, I'm troubled by that. The, the FAA was never intended for uh, uh, statutory claims or personal injury claims, like every week, I'll see someone's parents or grandparents allegedly, uh, alleging injury in a nursing home. And those claims do not arise out of a contract. Like one's right to be free from bodily harm. It's not linked to a contract. And so I don't think those claims, there's a whole universe of claims that should not be subject to arbitration. But unfortunately, uh, the FAA's view is really trans-substantive. It applies over every area of law. And um, so I, I have a strong love-hate relationship with arbitration. Uh, there's some wonderful aspects and for every positive aspect i think with sports arbitration it could serve uh, the party's needs very well um and there's so many great examples of arbitration but at the same time i see a lot of abuse by certain parties and i think that's that's what got me interested in the history of the faa what was it really intended to do and i saw that uh the drafters the reformers back in the 1920s they they were very sincere working with complete good faith very, very passionate about the use of arbitration. They thought that the court system was so stuck in its ways, they wanted to innovate and break free. And um, so I don't see any hint of claim suppression when I look at the original intent behind the FAA. And uh, I geek out about arbitration. I love this topic. Um, but they used to, right when the FAA was passed, something that amazed me is just they, uh, they celebrated it. And it was a part, they tried to make it a part of everyday conversation. They tried to make it... Um, as much as it's, uh, they had a party, a party on Fifth Avenue. It was at the time during the Roaring Twenties, it was like a great Gatsby party, a black tie affair, where the main purpose was to celebrate arbitration. And I can't imagine having a party, and this is covered in the newspapers all around the country. I can't imagine having a party today. I would, but just 
for society to celebrate yeah. arbitration. Well, or, and um, you're right. It was such, it was always meant to be business to business. And you think about the New York Chamber of Commerce and their role in even creating the Federal Arbitration Act. And, and you look at even before that in terms of arbitration being really a way for, in, for business decisions and contract claims to be determined. In fact, um, I'm sure you know this from your history, but um, arbitration continued even during the American Revolutionary War with traders in England, US and, and England. I mean, they would actually still be doing business and, and arbitration created a vehicle in order to promote these kind of continuing relationships. Um, again, being innovative, and not sort of stuck in the ways of the courts, but now we see this creep. Um, and and I also, it brings back, you know, kind of going back to the Henry Schein case, you know, I'm thinking of, um, I think you and I both worked on the amicus in Rent-A-Center, right? I mean, I think Rent-A-Center played a big role in sort of delegation clauses growing. Yeah, I think Rent-A-Center really, um, for me, I see a shift after Rent-A-Center, more and more cases were simply sent to the arbitrator to decide arbitrability matters. And there's a, um, I, I, the arbitrators I've worked with have all worked in good faith. They want to come up with a just decision. Um, but one aspect about arbitrability bothers me. Um, it's the sense that I will rule on my own jurisdiction as an arbitrator, and I have my own financial incentive. If this were the courts, that would clearly violate due process, even a small financial interest of the judge in the case. This is not talking about the merits. I'm talking about just ruling on arbitrability oh, yeah. matters. Mm -hmm. It's... Um, and so I, I think that a solution here would be to have two different arbitrators. One, if, if delegation were to continue and it was giving it strong blessing in Renna Center, maybe one arbitrator should decide arbitrability. And then if there is an arbitrable claim, it would get sent to a second arbitrator to decide on the merits. But um, I, I'm troubled by delegation. I don't think that the widespread use that we have today was ever intended by the SPAR statute and just by chance, uh, I read yesterday a news article that this week there's a, there, a, there's a plan to reintroduce in Congress arbitration reform. And so that way, and the idea is that we should have different systems, say, for consumer claims versus business to business or international. Um, there's, and if you look at the original intent behind the FAA, it was just never intended to cover such a wide variety of disputes that we see today. Yeah. Yeah, really good points. You know, this has just been fantastic. And your book, by the way, um, is really fantastic. So for people, again, just remind everybody the title and where they can find it. Sure. Um, I just completed a new book. It's called An Annotated Record, Legislative Record of the Federal Arbitration Act. And um, I wrote a, a book years ago about its history, about the full history and background of the FAA. And in my most recent book, it's more of a compilation of the entire legislative record but I've heavily annotated each section of the uh, legislative record uh, with just background facts to give a bigger context into how and why. Why at this particular time in American history did um, the Federal Arbitration Act, was it, why was it enacted? And I see so many parallels to today. Actually, they went through a pandemic just like we did. And um, just the main visionary behind the FAA, uh, there's a story while he was lobbying, he actually was self-quarantining, he had caught the flu. And so he's whispering through a keyhole uh, to his assistant, you know, please speak to this senator. We have to take care of this and this, this to get the act, this Federal Arbitration Act passed. And so there was such a strong, um, there's a sense that our courts were lagging behind. Mm -hmm. And um, and I still see that today. And I saw your email earlier this week about the online dispute resolution and the, um, the New York courts, the small claims courts. And that's so, I see that, that dynamic that goes on today that we can reform things, we can do things better. And I think the pandemic is causing us to rethink just what is meaningful, how can we do things in a better way? That same spirit and very similar circumstances occurred at the same time in the 1920s, right after the, that 1918 pandemic and right after World War I. People were questioning, you know, what is the role of courts in society? And so I'm really into the history. And uh, if, you, if anyone has any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. I'm fast. I could talk forever about the history. Oh, I love it. No, and I'm, I'm a kindred spirit. I love it. I really do. Listen, I thank you. Thank you for taking the time with us today. It was a great conversation, learned a lot. And um, I also just really love your book and the history of the Federal Arbitration Act. I think it really also gets into, like you said, you know, arbitration as a problem solving tool, not a problem creating tool. And how can we sort of bring that spirit back into arbitration? So listen, thank you. I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you for this opportunity. Thanks so much. Thanks, Amy.